Thanks for turning up despite the first lecture. Uh, all right, so, so the aim for this lecture is to prove this sort of a weak, not some sort of a weak version of the Mayan on. It's this that Omega is Taylor, if and only if. So let Chi be a Taylor form. There exists an epsilon greater than zero, so that Integral okay. Notice that this is a weaker version in the sense that it's assuming more. The original de Mayen Pon result was the integral of omega raised to p over v is positive for all v, right? Here you need some sort of a uniform positivity. Uh, in fact, the de Mayen Pon theorem proves a purely algebraic result, right? I mean, which is interesting even in the projective setting. That is, this is positive for all v implies this. Right. This, uh, I mean, I don't know if there's an algebraic proof of it, purely algebraic proof of this, purely algebraic fact, but nonetheless. Anyway. Ah, so you're right. I'm very sorry. M is projective. What am I calling it? M or X or something. Uh, sorry, I don't remember what. Yeah, it's M. Yeah, M is projective. Okay, so it's weak in two ways. One is this, one is this. The reason I'm taking M to be projective is because um, many things become simpler if I assume M is projective. In fact, Bade and I, in our paper, we assumed M was projective and we proved a certain theorem. And now it has been generalized to the Kähler setting. So, so that's why I don't have the T, right? All right, so let's see, how does one prove this? Again, recall the strategy is the following. So you take omega plus T chi for all T greater than or equal to zero. For large values of T, this is a Kähler class. The set of T for which this is a Kähler class is obviously open. So suppose you have a sequence of Tns converging to T naught. So replacing omega with omega plus t naught chi without loss of generality, you assume t naught is zero. Okay. So from now onwards, I'll assume t naught is zero. Yeah. And through this uh, strict positivity implies this uniform. I mean, to my proved that. Let me be very specific. They proved this implies omega. Omega is a tail class. This is what they proved. So in in particular, in the projective case, this would imply this. Right. So. For all t greater than, so the, the original de Mayen Pond theorem was omega plus t chi raised to p, uh, integral is positive over, over all v with all t greater than or equal to zero. That implied, I mean, their theorem was this, this condition implied that this was a Kähler class. Now, in the case of projective manifolds, you don't need the t, right? So this implies that omega is a Kähler class, and hence this is true. Right. So this 
like the as in the we want to show this class is given. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I didn't quite understand the question. Yeah, like the continuity method is assuming that this uh, inequality holds for all the varieties B, then you get that third class is catered. That's what you're assuming. Yeah, I mean, the continuity method is, is yeah, so assuming that omega plus T chi is, so the, the continuity parameter is T, is scalar for all T, this is what we want to prove. So for large T, this is scalar, and we want to see what happens if you take a limit of T's going. Yeah. Actually, have a just by using the fact that omega being scalar implies omega minus T chi is in T. Yeah, I, I meant this implies this almost trivially using Demai and Pon. If you if you know this implication, of course this is larger than epsilon times chi, and therefore this is true, right? If if you already know omega is a Kähler class, then there is a representative. Let's call it omega phi, if you wish, which is larger than some epsilon times chi, and so that's why this is true. The, the, the question is, if you are not allowed to assume Demai and Pon, can you prove this directly algebraically? In other words, if the integral, for the sake of argument, this is not true, but suppose the set of all sub-varieties of dimension P was a compact based and this was a continuous function, then you could have concluded by compactness that this was the case. But that's not quite true, but had it been true, this would have been an easy implication, but it's not. You have to go through Demai and Pawn to prove this. At least I don't know of any purely algebraic way to do it. Uh, yeah. But then, okay, so if our statement is what you've written with the uniform of revenge, then at some point we also need to prove that Kaler implies that. No, no, so, sorry, what, what do you mean? Uh, Kaler implies this is, is, he, is obvious, right? That, that's what I'm saying. So Kaler implies this. Sorry, where is the eraser? eraser? <laughs> I just, I see. I thought I just used it, but maybe not. Next. Yes, sorry. No. Yeah, so. You're showing actually that only the uniform version is positive. Right, right. So. But at uh, some point, there is some step that is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, uh, the Maya and Pond do not prove this as an intermediate step. I'm doing it just to illustrate the ideas of the proof because this is a little easier to do, right? Um, the full, yeah. In fact, even in the case of the J equation, Gauchen proved something akin to this. He proved that if you have some uniform positivity condition, that then you have a pointwise positive representative. Getting rid of the uniformity is not trivial. They and I did it in the projective case and then Song did it in the Kayla case for the J equation. Okay. So yeah, so this is this is just for illustrative purposes doing the speaker version. Right. Okay. All right. So so the first step here, so I'm going to assume without loss of generality that this is zero. So the first step is to produce a Kayla. Parent. That is a current satisfying, um, let's say, beta times Kähler form. Okay, this is the first step. So, how does one produce a Kähler current again? So, the idea is as follows. So, what Demai and Pond did, this step is easier in the projective cycle. Okay. Right, so what Demai and Pond did was as follows. I'm so sorry. They proved the concentration of noise.
Okay. So this theorem was as follows that uh, if you give me, so if you, if, if you give me, I mean, I, maybe I won't state their theorem in full generality. Uh, what I will prove in the projective case is as follows. We can prove if M is projective, we can prove this by doing the following thing. Suppose Y is uh, a smooth ample divisor, then we can prove the following, where this is the current of integration over So what's the current of integration? So that's this. If you test it against an n minus one, uh, this is an n minus one, n minus one smooth form. This is the integral of this over y. Okay. This is this is obviously a, a positive current in the sense that if I take these kinds of forms, this integral is always going to be positive, right? So this is what one can prove in the projective case uh, using the method of the Mayan form, which I'll describe in a moment. How does this help? There exists a T, suppose you give me a smooth ample divisor, there exists a T in this class that satisfies this, right? How does this help? It helps because if you find such a T, you can do the following. You can, you can for example, do this where uh, S is the defining section of Y, of the line bundle Y, and H is a metric with positive direction. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, this, maybe I should have written this elsewhere, but I want to save space for the proof, okay? So if I manage to do this, I can extract some positivity out of this because this is an ample divisor, right? In other words, this is cohomologically equivalent to a Kähler form using the poincare lelong formula, right? So in other words, this is greater than 2y plus 2 plus, let's say, 2 times beta times the Kähler form chi. Let's say, without loss of generality, chi is this particular Kähler form. That it's the curvature of, the, of this line. Okay. So you can immediately get, from this, you can get this condition just by using cohomology, right? Just by adding del del bar of a certain function you get this condition. Okay. Is it like what is after four? It's ah, beta. Beta is some positive number. There exists a positive, there exists a current T and a positive number beta, so that the sum. Right. No, basically, for this it means that it's greater than or equal. Right. So what that means is this. If you take the difference of these two, it's a current, right? So you test it against these kinds of forms.
and you want this to be greater than zero for all one zero smooth forms alpha. Again, why this odd looking expression? Because this expression, when restricted to any uh, n minus one dimensional subspace, is a volume form. Okay. okay. Right. Okay. So the, so so we want to prove this theorem. What Demai and Pawn do is they prove something a little more general than this. Here we are concentrating mass on a divisor. They're, in their paper, they, they, they were able to prove that you could concentrate mass on any dimensional sub-variety. So what, although it's, it's not relevant for our purposes, in case you're interested in what you do in the non-projective case, small digression, you take the diagonal in M cross M and you concentrate mass on the diagonal and you take a push forward. Okay, so suppose, suppose you take, um, the, the, the key observation is if you take this is some something times chi. So the key observation is, if you concentrate mass on the diagonal and you take some sort of a push forward, then you can get a Kähler current. The reason is, in a, the reason you have to do this strange trick is because you don't have any sub-varieties to concentrate mass on in a general Kähler manifold. In a projective case, you have lots of sub-varieties and you can take advantage of that to do this trick. Okay. So the name is concentration of mass. Where do you concentrate mass? That's the question, right? And for Demai and Pon, the variety they chose to concentrate mass was the diagonal in M cross M. Okay. That's just chosen because there you know you have at least one. You have at least one, right? Yeah. Okay, so how does one prove this? So first of all, the, the, before we prove the existence of a T in this cohomology class, the first question is, is there any current in any cohomology class other than this one that has this property in the first place, right? So here's an example. So if I take, this function where is a partition of unity gj is a local defining function for why gj's are local defining functions for why and t is real okay if you look at these kinds of forms as t approaches zero what happens is the, this function becomes singular wherever gj becomes zero and del del bar of this function puts some mass on the places where g becomes zero, right? So in other words, phi t is expected to, is expected is expected to put mass on y as t approaches t. Okay.
Indeed, this was proven by Demai and Pon. Here is a, a little calculation shows you the, this following fact. So the proposition in Demai and Pond is that if Y is a point on the variety, Y is this, U is this neighborhood of, sorry, Y is the sub variety. Y is a point. U is a neighborhood. And VT is another neighborhood. Okay. U is a neighborhood of Y. VT is this neighborhood. Uh, psi zero is less than natural log T where psi naught is this. So, uh, so as t becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, this neighborhood size shrinks, right? What they proved was this. There exists constants P sub u and delta sub u positive so that for all t small enough, this integral is positive. What does it mean to put some mass on y? What that means is chi t is a, expected to be at least as much as a Dirac delta centered on y. So that integral, uh, so if, if you pretend that this is the current of integration over y, integral of chi raised to n minus one over y is the volume of y over u, right? This we know is certainly strictly positive. This is just a manifestation of this fact. Right. So this is what it means to put some mass on Y. So, so this is just a calculation. Once you prove this, So we want to produce some current T in omega that somehow behaves like chi T, right? So how does one do that? One solves these Mont-Jampere equations. I'll call the CT. Uh, Omega T is here. Right. So what I'll do is I'll solve a Mont-Jampere equation for every T, uh, this particular Mont-Jampere equation. If Omega T and Chi T were in the same cohomology class, then by uniqueness, we would have concluded that Omega T was equal to Chi T. And by Demai and Pond's proposition, we could have concluded that omega, the limit of omega t is as t approach zero, put some mass on y, right? Unfortunately, we don't, we don't know whether this class is scalar or not. That's the whole problem, right? So, I mean, we don't know whether the limiting class is scalar or not. This is a scalar class for all t strictly positive. We want to know what happens when t is exactly equal to zero, right? 
So the idea is, so th this can be solved by Yao's theorem. Solution exists by Yao. Moreover, if you take a sequence Pn converging to zero, there exists a, up to a subsequence passing to a subsequence. Omega Tn converges to some current T weakly. Okay, this is an abstract functional analytic result, the Barnack allow glue theorem. Okay. Right. All we have to do is to prove that this limiting T puts some mass on Y. Right. So how does one do that? Uh, Okay. Okay. Yeah, the 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 ambient manifold is projected. Why coming into the Because chi t concentrates mass on y. What Kai T recall was defined as follows. It's the model form. This concentrates mass on Y. Maybe we want to prove that the right hand side behaves a certain way, so the solution also behaves similar. That's the that's the point. Right? So um, now by, by the Skoda L Mir extension theorem, if you take the characteristic function of Y times the limiting uh, positive current T, this is closed, right? And by the standard support theorems, it's some multiple of Y. This much we already know. The question is, is this multiple positive or not? That's the only thing that needs to be proven. In other words, if we prove that, Exactly the same kind of result as for chi t, integral of omega t, which chi raised to n minus 1, for all t, we will be done. Okay? That will prove that indeed this multiple mu is positive. So all we need to do is to prove this inequality for the solution of the monotone pair equation, very similar to the inequality that the model form satisfied, right? Okay. So how does one prove this? So first step is, uh, so suppose, Let's let's pretend. Um, let's do something point wise. Uh, or maybe let let lambda one be the eigenvalues of omega t with respect to chi t. Okay. So you, you contract the scalar form with this one and get an endomorphism and let these be the eigenvalues. So if we look at the places where lambda one is sort of large, so the idea is that lambda one is large on a set of reasonably large measure. I, I'm, I'm lying a little bit here. But that's the, the rough idea. Okay? This is what we want to do. If that is true, then indeed this is true. Okay? This is the key idea. 
So let's look at the set. Let's define this set. Uh, so first of all, the product of these lambda i's, lambda 1 to lambda n, is ct, because omega t raised to n is ct pi, pi t raised to n. Okay. Right. So uh, let E beta be the following set where the product of the others of the larger eigenvalues is at least so. Okay. On E beta complement, the product of these eigenvalues is less than this, which means lambda 1, uh, so since lambda 1 to lambda n is what ct, this is less than c beta inverse, so lambda 1 is larger than ct times beta over c. Okay? So on the complement of the set, lambda 1 is large. And we want to see if, if on the complement of the set, this integral is large or not. Okay, that, that's the, the, we want to know something about the measure of this set. Right. Now we note that the integral of lambda 2 times pi t raised to n over all of m is less than a constant c. Okay. The reason is which is less than c independent of t. This is obviously larger than this point wise, right? Because this, this has all the other symmetric, uh, all the other symmetrization of this expression. Okay. Um, the integral of, of pi t, so uh, let, let me, sorry. Let's return to this. So this expression is larger than this expression. Okay, and we want to prove this is large. Right. So this is obviously larger than lambda one times chi t i raised to n minus 1. Sorry. Which is larger than beta. Okay. So we simply have to prove that this expression is positive independent of t, right? So this expression is this Minus the integral over B, e B of this. Okay. This we know is larger than some delta u. This is by De and Pons proposition. This, on the other hand, is less than a large constant times beta. Okay. So as a consequence, if beta is small is say 
less than delta u raised to 2 raised to n minus 1 times 10, for example, this is positive. So that means this is strictly positive. Delta U prime is positive. Right. So the concentration of mass is not too difficult to prove. You just produce a model form, solve the Monge Ampere equation, and prove that the solution of the Monge Ampere equation behaves like the model form in some sense. For all other PD, including the J equation, the co concentration of mass, the proof will be similar. That is, you, you, you solve a certain PD with a certain right-hand side that degenerates to become a current, and you prove that your solution behaves like that current using similar sorts of inequalities. So we've managed to prove the first step in the Demian, in the weak version of the Demian Bond theorem, that's concentration of mass. So, as of now, what we have is M is projective, right? And there exists a current in this. Some say two beta times y, two beta times. Y. So you have a Taylor current in your uh, class. Now, yeah. Hi, you know that you can, if it's Taylor, you know that you can produce Taylor currents that behave in that. Yes, way, yes. Said, but you don't know it for the correct class. Yes. That's why you use a Marsh Ampere, yeah. basically. Yeah. Okay, so now the next step is smoothening things out, regularization, right? Okay, so how does one regularize even continuous? For example, suppose you have a, a continuous function. And let's say this is larger than some delta times chi. Then can we find a smooth function phi epsilon? Maybe let's say, suppose we manage to find a continuous function. Can we find a smooth function so that this is larger than maybe delta 2 over chi? This is the question. Is there a smooth? Maybe I'll say P tilde. Is there a smooth P tilde so that this happens? Okay. If, if C were continuous, how do you solve this problem? You use this Richtberg regularization technique. So the idea here is you take your manifold and you cover it up with coordinate balls of radius 2r so that the balls of radius r also cover n. And on each coordinate ball, right, the coordinate balls are chosen to be so small that chi is approximately Euclidean, right? Uh, and chi is also del del bar of some pi, and phi i is a, approximately mod z squared, right? So you choose coordinate balls so that this happens. I mean, I can make the approximations precise, but might as well just keep them like this. And what you do is you take, um, you take, sorry, not, uh, what am I saying? Oh, sorry. So locally, uh, Locally, omega is also, sorry, what I want to do is not this. I want to say 
Okay, this is this is going to be stupid, but bear with me nonetheless. Maybe maybe I'll change the statement of this. What we want is does there exist a PN smooth such that chi plus PN is larger than this and PN converges to P point once. Let's say we want to approximate continuous functions by these. So locally, this is del del bar of something. And we are going to assume that the coordinate balls are small enough so that this is mod z squared. Then this is locally del del bar of p naught plus p. And you take the convolution of these. So you, you get these convolutions. These convolutions are smooth and they satisfy this. So the question is, how do you patch these convolutions up? So you get a bunch of local smooth things. How do you patch them up? So how do you patch Luri subharmonic functions up? One way is to take the maximum. The maximum of two pluri subharmonic functions is pluri subharmonic. How do you get a smooth uh, pluri subharmonic function? You, you sort of take this regularized maximum. So the regularized maximum of a bunch of pluri subharmonic functions is defined like this. It's sort of like a convolution of the maximum function. You add a bunch of numbers to each of these. And then you multiply by a cutoff function. Okay. So this is the regularized maximum construction. Uh, so it's, it's almost like the maximum, but you're sort of taking a convolution of the max function. So the regularized maximum of a bunch of pluri subharmonic functions is pluri subharmonic. Moreover, it satisfies this nice property that, for example, if this one, uh, if, if let's say p minus epsilon 1 is larger than pi plus epsilon i for all other i, then this will coincide with phi 1. So just like the maximum of a bunch of functions coincides precisely with the maximum of these functions, the regularized maximum also coincides with one of these functions, provided it satisfies a little bit more than being just a maximum, right? So what you can do in the Richberg trick is the following. So in the Richberg method, you take these. Now, we know that phi is continuous. So regardless of what coordinate chart you choose, for sufficiently small epsilon, these phi epsilons are all going to be very close to phi, the original function phi itself, right? So suppose you take this and you subtract it off, subtract a small multiple, let's say one over a billion, just to be on the safe side, times this, then what happens is this thing behaves roughly like a quadratic. So near the boundary of, of, of a ball, this does not contribute to the maximum. If you, take the, if you take any point on the boundary of a ball, it will lie in the interior of another smaller ball, right? And it, it, these functions do not contribute to the maximum because they become negative near the, they, they, you have a negative contribution near the boundary of these balls, okay? So that's the idea here. So you subtract off a little bit uh, to make sure that near, on the boundary of a ball, you, the, the regularized maximum is only, it, these things don't contribute to the regularized maximum, okay? So when you do that, then if you patch them up using the regularized maximum construction, you, you indeed get smooth functions that satisfy this. But you lose a little bit of positivity because you are subtracting this bit off. Okay, so there are two, two points here. In this technique, you lose a little bit of positivity. The second point 
is that it's crucial that P be continuous because regardless of what coordinate chart you choose to, to do the convolution, if epsilon is the convolution parameter is small enough, P epsilon is very close to the original function phi because of continuity. So each phi epsilon is close to the other phi epsilon. Okay? So on different coordinate charts, these phi epsilons are close to each other because the original function was continuous. Now, unfortunately, we want to use the same technique to, to make this smooth. But the challenge here is the corresponding potential here. This is not continuous, right? So how does one deal with that? That's, that's, the, that's the problem. This is not continuous. So as a consequence, this fails completely, right? All right. But despite this apparent failure of the Richberg method, Botsky and Savalje noticed the following thing. Okay. So, firstly, how do you measure the singularities of uh, pluri subharmonic functions? You define the Lelong number. So, to measure. So, so what's an example of a singular Lurie subharmonic function? The quintessential example is this one, right? So we want to measure the singularities of Lurie subharmonic functions or currents. So we define this object, the Lelong number, right? So you take P of Z by log of X minus mod Z square, where T is this locally. Okay. Right. Now the point is this, uh, this number a priori depends on the coordinates chosen, but actually, this is always finite, greater than or equal to zero, and independent of the coordinate system. All of this is there in Demai's book. Among other sources, but this is probably one of the best sources. Now the point is, uh, you also have a you also have this pleasant theorem. Seuss theorem, that is, this set, the places where the Lelong number is large, that is, the singularities are bad, is very small, is an analytic set. Okay, so it's a, it's a union of sub varieties, right? Okay. So, how does all of this help? So Botsky and Kavalje, they proved that if the Lelong number of t is zero, then Richberg works. That is, you don't need continuity. The real point is that you want the Lelong numbers to be zero. Gauchen uh, only used this technique to regularize this current which has non-zero Lelong numbers. His basic idea was uh, away from, he chose some C so that uh, C small enough so that away from this analytic set, the Lelong numbers are all smaller than C. And if you choose C to be sufficiently small, then this, this trick goes through and you can regularize this current. Okay, So that's the, that's the main point here. Thank you.
Yeah. But then you said you work on, like, you know, working on the whole of the Maybe I understood. So what you do is um, you choose T smaller. You choose T to be very small. Using the induction hypothesis, you produce a Kähler, a smooth Kähler representative in a neighborhood of this, of this analytic set. And far away from this analytic set, you use a convolution. And then you use regularized maxima, the regularized maximum construction to patch these yeah. things up. That regularized maximum construction works so if for, uh, away from this. Yeah. And you use the yeah. Induction yeah basically. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, right. Oh, sorry. Right. So, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Right, so here I have to cheat a little bit. Right. So this this technique, right. So this technique works perfectly well for the J equation. Unfortunately, for the and Pons uh, result, there is a small there is a problem with this technique. I'll cheat a little bit. I mean, I, I know I started off by claiming that I'll prove something, but I won't do that. I'll just mention one small point here. So uh, the, the problem here is I want to use this technique, but when I write it like this, what do I want to do? I want to write this locally as something, right? And I want to take a convolution. And I want to patch these things up, right? And I want to probably subtract off a little bit from this convolution, right? So, uh, so what should I subtract off? That's the that's the point. Uh, can I cheat? Can maybe maybe I'll just I'll just go ahead. That's what I was trying. To. Sorry, uh, I should have thought about this a little better because. It's a little, it's at this point, it's actually easiest to just go to the J equation directly, but since I promised to do the Mai and Pon, let me, let me uh, continue with this. Right. Okay, so, so the, uh, the idea is the following, cover N with finitely many balls, balls, such that, these also form a cover. Okay. Right. Now fix epsilon to be, I, I don't want to worry about pesky constants of two, three, and so on. So I'll just do some huge astronomical numbers. Now choose R to be so small that this scalar form is approximately a constant coefficient form. That is, this is uh, where this is Euclidean. Uh, this is basically del del bar mod z square. Okay. Further, assume that assume that what uh, omega is this 
I is also something. What is it? Uh, what am I calling these? So maybe I'll call this with a tilde. I'll call this omega, where p i minus mod z square is less than epsilon r square. Okay. So in other words, so p not i. This is very close to mod z square. Uh, okay. So now we'll do the following. So let this be the convolution, the delta convolution of, so let t be omega plus square root of minus one del del bar p t of p t plus p naught i minus this. Sorry for so many. Uh, I'm calling this with the variable epsilon. Right. Okay. So I'm taking so this is locally this. And I'm subtracting off a little bit here. Okay. Right. So now um if delta is small enough, this function is def well defined on a smaller ball, on let's say a ball of this radius. Okay. So there's this. So recall that what we want is to take the places where the Lelong number, the singularities are small. Now it turns out there is a refined version of the Lelong number. This particular quantity, which is called delta, uh, it's the supremum of P on a ball of radius R over four, supremum over a ball of radius R. Sorry, I'm changing these things. So this function log r goes to supremum of mod z equals r is convex. So pluri subharmonic functions, the supremum of pluri subharmonic functions are log convex. In other words, this is decreasing uh, as delta, this is increasing as delta decreases to zero, this decreases to the Lelong number. Okay. So you take these delta Lelong numbers, right? Uh, and what you do is the following. You say uh, So, so the, the key proposition that makes all of these things work is as follows. Proposition, Gauchen. This is the most important proposition. Let epsilon two be some constant, which I won't bother writing down. It's, a, it's just a constant that depends on N. For delta less than r over 20, the following holds. If, if the Lelong numbers are small enough, if these Lelong numbers are very small, then 
lots of technical conditions hold. I backed myself into a corner literally by writing this, the corner of the board for such an important proposition. But okay. I'm sorry. Uh, it was a bad idea. I'm sorry. I'll I'll write this thing properly, not in the corner of the board. Oh, we are. Ah, oh, Jesus Christ. Huh. Okay, maybe maybe the universe is telling me I shouldn't be doing this. Uh, sorry. The next time, I promise I'll write things more clearly. So the proposition in effect, is going to say the following. If your Lelong number is very small, then the Richberg trick works. That is, you take the regularized maxima and they patch up very well. If the Lelong number is large, that is, if you're in a neighborhood of the place where the Lelong number is large, and if you have a smooth function in that neighborhood, that is going to contribute to the regularized maximum. So that's the key point. If the Lelong number is small, then all of these convolutions will contribute to the regularized maximum. If the long number is large, the smooth one will contribute. And therefore, everything works well and everything patches up. That's the key point. Right? Yeah, but, but, but that, that's, that's just one part of the story. The other part is how do you produce a smooth thing in a neighborhood of a given variety? And that is where the uniform positivity condition will be used. Two different things. So, sort of before the structure of there, E being a catered current is really saying that that's the same, really, that's uh, the class being state, right? Yeah. 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 So, so, what the, the, the demand for the, the yeah. concentration of masses big and F implies the existence of a catered current. That's what the structure first show that. Yeah. You, you show that it's big. And then, I mean, it's of course NAF, obviously, and then you prove that big NAF um, has a Taylor current, and then that together with the induction, the, the other integration current. 